Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. We'll just give one more minute for folks to hop on. But in the meantime, this is uh, Metro Vision ID Exchange. Uh, the topic is Park and Ride, the Transportation Recreation Connection. Um, so uh, as a reminder, or just a bit of a heads up, this webinar will be recorded uh, and posted to drcog.org later today. So briefly covering the agenda. So we'll start off by talking about MetroVision quickly. Uh, and then after that, we have a few Dr. Cog announcements and a CDOT announcement. And then uh, we'll transition into our first two speakers, which are Rachel Brenna from Jefferson County Open Space and Jonathan Kane from Idaho Springs. Uh, we'll follow that by a 10 minute Q&A session. And then we'll transition into our next two speakers, which are gonna be Alex Hyde Wright from Boulder County and Danny O'Connor from the city of Boulder. Uh, following that, we'll have another 10-minute Q&A session, um, and then we'll wrap up from there. So MetroVision is our shared regional plan, uh, and it's the shared guiding vision for the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. It sets outcomes, objectives, and voluntary initiatives for uh, Dr. Cog members and partners to consider. Uh, it's long-range, aspirational, and regional in focus, and implementation is uh, dependent on many partners contributing in different paths and at different speeds. So ID exchanges, which is why we're here today, are an opportunity to highlight how local governments are advancing the uh, initiatives and objectives uh, outlined in MetroVision. MetroVision is divided into five overarching themes, which begin to describe the region's future. So these themes are organized also into 14 interrelated outcomes, um, which describe local governments and partners and how they're working together to achieve the uh, objectives and initiatives in MetroVision. So um, today we'll hear from our four speakers about how they're supporting the implementation of MetroVision by protecting and connecting people uh, to the region's diverse natural resources and open space, parks and trails, also helping support a connected multimodal region and promoting healthy and active choices. So a couple quick announcements uh, before we jump into our panelists. So Civic Academy is back. Um, Civic Academy is a nationally recognized uh, program that, where participants from local and lo learn from local experts and leaders have the opportunity to network with other residents uh, and then act on what they've learned. So since 2007, nearly 900 residents from around the region have completed Civic Academy. Uh, it's a great opportunity for emerging leaders um, and folks interested in getting more involved in uh, their regional governments and local governments uh, to learn about regional issues and uh, developing their own civic capacity. Topics covered include transportation, economic vitality, housing, civic engagement, and much more. Um, so it starts on September 20th and runs through November 1st. Uh, more, uh, if you have any additional questions on this, you can reach out to Kelsey Forfar Jones with Dr. Hong. Uh, so today, later today, um, our Dr. Cog is wrapping up the process of updating our regional transportation plan to align with the new greenhouse gas planning standard. Part of that process includes virtual public hearings, which will be, uh, which will be held today at 4 p.m. Um, and more information can be found on the drcog.org website and on the event calendar. Dr. Cog will also be embarking on the TDM strategic plan for the region. So the project, the project aims to provide a framework to improve mobility and expand our regional TDM efforts. The project is being completed with support from Urban Trans and will include stakeholder engagement from CDOT, RTD, and various transportation management agencies and organizations, local agencies and community organizations. If you wanna learn more or get involved, you can reach out to Kaylee Fallon, uh, who's the Emerging Mobility and TDM Planner at Dr. Cog. And finally, uh, CDOT uh, is also doing work around transportation demand management through the Office of Innovative Mobility. CDOT will host a transportation demand management conference on November 4th at the CDOT headquarters in Denver. Our registration in September 14th. Uh, for more information or how to get involved, you can reach out to Franzia Perez uh, with the Office of Innovative Mobility at uh, Colorado Department of Transportation. Uh, in addition, Colorado, uh, CDOT is uh, also hosting a strategic transportation demand management grant, which was developed by the Office of Innovative Mobility to support communities and organizations as they expand uh, and 
as they expand and enhance existing trip reduction initiatives. So uh, some of the projects that are have been awarded through this grant are include Summit County and their shuttle program to different trailheads. And they're also going to be working with Chatfield Reservoir on a micromobility project. So very closely related to the topic of the day, which is the transportation recreation connection. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to our first speaker, Rachel Brenna with Jefferson County Open Space. Hello, everybody. I'll um, go ahead and start my video so you can see more than a still photo. Um, I'm the trails program manager at Jefferson County Open Space. And what that means is I'm in charge of the Jefferson County Trails plan. And what that is, is a plan for trails for the entire county, not just for open space. So I maintain that plan, keep it updated, um, keep, keep people aware of what it has to say and how, what it can offer to our partners within the county. I also manage our trails partnership program, which is our funding mechanism to help implement the projects as proposed in the Jeff Jeffco Trails Plan. Next slide. So um, today we're gonna talk about how to get to our recreational amenities um, and what sort of transportation options there are. Here in uh, Jeffco Open Space, um, we recognize that that um, can mean a lot of different things. And we're, pretty uh, versed in trails. So we, we're we starting there. That's one place that we can have an impact and have some influence throughout the county. Um, next slide. So, you know, generally we think of trails as a way of moving through the landscape. And that can be in an urban setting, it can be in a rural setting, it can be in the mountains and through our open spaces. Um, so trails can provide a variety of services for a variety of people and provide a variety of functions. Next slide. It can, primarily we think of transportation and recreation as being the two main things that we look to trails to provide to our residents and visitors. Next slide. So we're thinking about how we can combine those two and use the trails not only for recreation or transportation, but as transportation to the recreation. And that is one of um, the, the multimodal aspects of how we'd like to see our parks function in the future. Next slide. So here are some um, images of Jefferson County. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, I'm guessing that quite a few are. Um, you'll see in the first image there, um, that's the, the northern half of Jefferson County. The little bit that's cut off at the bottom in these is all, almost entirely national forest. So, we don't have a whole lot of purview over that part of the county. But what you can see in this first image here is that our parks, our open spaces, the county open spaces live largely in the western part of the county on the western side of um, E470 and Highway 93. And then in the next slide, in the next image, you can see um, all of the municipalities within Jefferson County. And how and those are co color coded. So we have about eight in Jefferson County, um, and that's quite a, a lot of different people um, in charge of trails. And then in the last one, you can see where the population centers are. So the darker colors are where our population is focused. So and this happens across the Front Range. We have uh, population centers that are not located adjacent to our large open spaces. So then the question becomes, how are people getting to those open spaces? How are they traveling? Um, are they going by car, by bus, by bike? And typically I think the answer is car. So in looking at, at this situation and what we've got going on here, we have a lot of different partners, a lot of different players um, trying to accomplish the same things. And within each of those municipalities, all of our partners also have different groups that are trying to um, look at transportation and recreation. So we have our parks and recreation trails, open space groups, we have transportation um, professionals, and then we also have the planners. So that's a lot of different people trying to get um, residents and visitors from home to parks and open space uh, throughout the county. Next slide. 
So to look at that in a more holistic way, um, we initiated the creation of the Jeffco Trails Plan. And um, that was adopted in 2020. Next slide. And it in entailed reaching out to not only our residents and visitors, but also all of the state, local, and federal partners, um, advocacy groups, nonprofits, um, all of those people to sort of get on the same page. We formed what was called the Jeffco Trails Council, and that group of people helped guide the creation of the Jeffco Trails Plan. Um, you can see here some of the stats associated with the creation of the plan. Next slide. The vision that came out of the plan is a healthier, engaged community connected by trails. And I think the big word um, in this vision is connected by trails. It, um, and that the healthy, engaged part is part of the plan, but the part I wanna focus on today is the connected piece and how we can get um, our community connected by um, trails and non-motorized uh, methods. Next slide. So the, the three priorities um, of the plan was to create partnerships within the county to increase connectivity, access, and safety. And those are things that we often see associated with trail networks. Um, one thing I wanna point out here is the safety aspect. And that's important in this trails plan because it really brings in partnerships with um, transportation and transportation networks. Um, trails themselves are often built to specific safety standards, but without bringing in the transportation professionals, um, we're missing the links and the safe crossings and coordinating um, trails access through busy intersections, um, under highways, all of that. So the safety aspect is, is really an important piece of this plan as far as creating the partnerships. Next slide. So here are some of the maps that came out of the plan as a result. We have um, detailed maps about local projects and uh, then some, the regional corridors that we'd like to see happen, ones that exist already and, and how we'd like to expand those. And then also a look at the equitable access throughout the county. So the way that these projects were developed um, was by going out to all of our partners within the county and asking them what their priorities are. So this plan doesn't attempt to set out priorities for other communities and other municipalities, but it, it lifts up and supports um, the priorities that those communities already have uh, for their own planning efforts. So all of those plans were considered um, and brought into the Jeffco Trails plan. So some of the projects are local and those are things that could happen within wholly within a park or, or a green space in one jurisdiction. And then the other push is for uh, regional trail corridors and how we can get those expanded. And then lastly, we looked at equitable access and we divided up the county into two uh, subsets. One is the plains area, which is shown here in sort of the green color. And those in that area that our goal is to have folks um, be able to access a trail or a green space within a 10 minute walk of their home. And then in the blue area and the more mountainous areas, uh, a 10 minute drive is the goal. So as we continue to update this plan and work on these projects, um, this gives you an overview of what we're looking at. Okay, next slide. So some of the regional connections that I'd like to point out um, are that are projects listed in the Jeffco Trails plan include some of these ones listed here. And the map that's shown on the right there is the greater Denver area. So it's a good snapshot of how, um, you know, what trail networks the people in the Denver metro area have access to. And this doesn't even show them all as you're all pretty aware. The one thing that I'll point out is that um, not many of these go into the mountains. So it's, it's a challenge to get on your bike in downtown Denver and make it up into the mountains. And one of the trails that does that right now is the Peaks to Plains Trail. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in, the minute, in a minute. 
Um, a couple of other opportunities are, you know, is the Rocky Mountain Greenway, and that's shown in sort of a light pink here. And it connects the arsenal to two ponds up to Rocky Flats, and then eventually up to Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, right now, it just about gets to Rocky Flats, and then the rest of it is envisioned. But those will be some opportunities to get into our larger open spaces um, without a vehicle in the future. Another one that's coming up is the Colorado Front Range Trail, and it is, um, covers the state it, in its um, eventuality. It will do that. Right now, it is just pieced together through existing trail segments. Um, and I think there's about 200 some miles of that that's been designated. Next slide. So a little bit more about the Peaks to Plains Trail. This is an effort that we're really focusing on. It's um, known as the Clear Creek Trail in some parts and there are several segments. Um, it starts at the South Platte Greenway in Commerce City and right now goes um, through uh, the Eastern part of Jefferson County into Golden, then there's some gaps, it picks up again the western edge of Jefferson County into Clear Creek, and then there are parts of it that are complete through, um, through Clear Creek County up to the Continental Divide. So this is one trail that we um, see as being a great opportunity to get people from their homes on their bikes and into the mountains to enjoy all that the canyons and um, natural spaces in the mountains have to offer. Um, it is, as those of you who live in um, the foothills know, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, these aren't easy places to build trails, but it's a priority um, for us. And, and it's one connection that we hope will alleviate some of the congestion at the trailheads at some of our other parks. Um, one idea of this planning effort is to not only connect people to the open spaces in Jefferson County through means other than vehicles, but also to allow them to experience trails and open spaces and parks near their home. So by spreading out the access throughout the county, um, we're hoping to uh, mitigate some of those impacts to the mountain spaces and the mountain trailheads um, with you know, people parking on the roads and the pack trailheads on the weekends and that kind of thing. So it's one more approach to help um, make that visitor experience a lot better and take some of the pressure off of the most popular and most heavily visited open spaces. Next slide. Um, the Front Range Trail is shown here. We're working on a feasibility study for that through Northern Jefferson County from uh, Golden up to Boulder. And this shows the recommended alignment. And again, this alignment, um, the focus is uh, creating nature-based experiences and is more of a recreational focus. However, it will uh, provide a transportation focus too, um, specifically up to Rocky Flats and down to North Table Mountain. So this will be an, a great opportunity for folks to hop on their bikes or get on their hiking shoes and be able to walk to all of the parks and open spaces um, along the Front Range Trail. Next slide. So uh, another part of the Jeffco Trails plan is a funding piece. And again, one part of that is the Trails Partnership Program. And that is something that open space, uh, we run it annually and it provide funding for our partners um, to build trails or trail amenities. Um, the program is in its third year and we've uh, funded about, mm, about $6 million of trail projects to this point. Um, we also see the plan as a way to coordinate other funding opportunities with our partners. Um, we'll look uh, with City of Arvada at the Front Range Trail and getting that corridor built through Arvada and then up into Rocky Flats and into Boulder County. Next slide. So the other parts of the plan are to provide this annual update where we will um, do things like update definitions, um, get some shared definitions. This little uh, graphic here is from the Jeffco bike plan. So we'd like to coordinate with um, the county a little bit better on the bike plan and get those things in line. 
Um, also, same with our goals with the county and our partners. Um, the more people we have supporting specific projects, the more likely it is to happen. And especially for these regional trail corridors that will move people from their home into the mountains and into our open spaces, um, those trails often and those trail corridors go through many different jurisdictions and require a lot of different partnerships along the way. Um, the last thing we'll look at in more depth is the equity piece. Next slide. So this is uh, just a little snapshot of one of the maps we've created. All of the red dots here are addresses that do not live within the walk shed. So they don't have access um, from their home within a 10 minute walk. And sometimes it looks like they're right next to a green space or a trail, but because of a railroad or a water crossing or something of that nature, they don't have access. They have to walk all the way around to get there with a 10 minute walk. Um, the next slide shows those same addresses um, overlaid um, median household income. So this is just something I put together quick for this presentation, but it shows the level of um, analysis we'd like to do in our subsequent updates of the Jeffco Trails Plan to really hone in on what areas might, um, of, might benefit from trail corridors the most or people who lack access um, and maybe don't have access to a car or other forms of transportation. So that's coming up down the road. Next slide. And that's um, my little quick blurb about the Jeffco Trails Plan and how um, we see it as functioning um, within the county to coordinate all of the efforts of um, our partners within the county to get people to our parks and open spaces close to their homes or um, available without getting into a car. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Rachel. Rachel. And I will we'll go ahead and transition over to our next speaker, which is Jonathan Kane from the city of Idaho Springs. Jonathan. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jonathan Kane. I'm the assistant city administrator here in Idaho Springs. I wear a lot of hats, but one of the things that I do here is help to manage tourism in the city, and that kind of has a lot of facets, parking management, and just how people in general travel to the city. Um, next slide. Just a little bit about our city. It was founded in 1859 when the first significant gold strike of the Pikes Peak Gold Rush happened here. Um, a cousin of Kit Carson named George Jackson hit Pater right about where this picture was taken, just to the right of where the picture is. Since that time, the city has been known as a center of mining and industry. What's a little bit less known is that even from those very early days, the city was a flourishing center of tourism. We've always been one of Denver's favorite day trips because early on, the Colorado and Southern Train uh, and Railroad began bringing folks up to the city. That's continued even as the mining industry died down following World War II. People continue to come here at first, just coming along Highway 6 to soak in the hot springs or explore the legacy of mining here. And now we have a lot of outdoor recreational amenities that surround us. Clear Creek is the second most rapid river in the state and there's multiple opportunities for fishing, scenic tourism, camping, and all that kind of thing that happened in Clear Creek County. Next slide. We are in a tourism renaissance right now. I joke a little bit about most of the people in this room have probably been here for pizza or beer, but it's true. It's a gateway to the Rocky Mountains for most people. They come for coffee or, or a beer or pizza, like I said, but they also come for all sorts of different adventures in the Rocky Mountains. We have been in a renaissance since the COVID-19 pandemic. We were early on predicted to be one of the hardest hit economies in the country due to the nature of our service and tourism businesses. But we acted proactively and together, and we opened what was one of the first outdoor pedestrian malls when the Safer and the Outdoors Public Health Orders came out on our historic Miner Street, which is pictured in this picture here. Um, since that time, we've had record sales tax numbers every month. Um, today, we still have the marketplace operating, and we've expanded it to be able to provide festivals and common consumption areas throughout the district. The, the tourism and service economy is really the lifeblood of our city. It provides about 60% of our general fund revenue, 
And we have a separate sales tax levy that goes to support road and related infrastructure projects. This fall, our voters will also be considering a ballot measure to utilize sales tax dollars to help defray some of the costs of water and sewer um, for residents of the city. It's kind of a big deal because that means that we'll no longer have enterprise funds for those for those for water and sewer, which means that they'll be subject to taper rules. But it's a really important way that our community can share that cost with tourists. Um, next slide. We take the management of tourism in our city very important. Our proximity to Interstate 70 provides the revenue to the city that's our lifeblood, but it can also significantly impact our residents and business owners alike. When Interstate 70 is congested, which is very frequent these days, it can bring much welcome traffic into the city and patrons to our restaurants, museums, and attractions, but it also brings congestion and inherent safety dangers. It fills our parking spaces, making it difficult for visitors and residents alike to access our shops, restaurants, and even our dentist office. It prompts visitors to park in our residential areas, which for residents in our town sometimes means that folks can't cl park close to their homes, feeling as if they're prisoners. Sometimes folks express that Idaho Springs is being loved to death. We have been working very hard and proactively to develop some management goals around tourism to address this problem. These five um, topics here are kind of the, the crux of our strategy. And I'm going to talk specifically about the first one and the fourth one managing our parking inventory, and promoting multimodal transit through our city and region. These all kind of form the backbone of our asset-based approach to community preservation. One interesting thing about Idaho Springs is that we are not a mountain resort community. We're a fairly dense urban area that is in close proximity to a lot of resorts. And so we have this kind of balancing of the delivery of service and goods to residents with the needs of our tourist economy. Managing our parking inventory is how we started to think about managing um, tourism-related traffic back in 2019. We uh, participated in an Urban Land Institute technical advisory panel in which it was advised that if we were to manage our parking resources downtown and close by, we could create better outcomes for residents so that they could park near their homes, and we could better manage the infrastructure and resources downtown to make sure that when people come, they're visiting our downtown and not staying for days on end as they go camping or on other adventures. We started a pretty controversial parking program in 2019 based on that recommendation. We entered a public-private partnership with a private parking management firm to manage our 488 commercial parking spaces. We also created a residential permit-only area <clears throat> on our downtown street or our residential streets downtown uh, where only residents of the city could park. And then we created a program so that residents of the city and county could park for free and employees of downtown businesses could park for free. We manage this program contextually. So different parts of the season where we might have less tourism related traffic, maybe the price of parking goes down or maybe it goes up when we do have high demand. That program has been a relatively strong success and it's now managed in an enterprise fund that's dedicated to downtown improvements. We also have quantitative data now related to how visitors and residents utilize our downtown parking, and that has informed discussions of building a new mobility hub on Interstate 70 that will include a parking garage to increase our capacity based on those numbers. This is kind of the crux of our, our, our transit management plan for the city. What we're trying to do is to continue balancing the residential needs of our community with the tourism needs and keep tourists where they where they want to be, which is typically in our historic downtown and on our east end. We've also been developing a new node in our town at the Argo Mill, which is a national historic site where we have about 500 acres of land and we have a public-private partnership with that group to provide uh, mountain bike trails that are gonna be accessible. There'll be downhill mountain bike trails and they'll be accessible by gondola. So it'll be a really cool park um, that we have as a recreational amenity in our town. Uh, next slide. This is our big project right now related to transportation management. One of the things that's really important to the city is to think about how congestion on Interstate 70 affects our residents and our businesses. In some ways, it's really great because when the highway is congested, everybody comes to Idaho Springs to eat pizza or to hang out or do whatever they're going to do. But in other ways, it creates all these other impacts that I've discussed briefly. We have been working with CDOT to create what we're calling a mobility hub. And this mobility hub will include about 300 spaces of new parking, including electrified vehicle parking. And it will include um, enhanced mobility services for 
our intra-county transit, which is called the roundabout, for Project Pegasus, which is CDOT's new um, small-scale mass transit opportunity, and then Bustang and Bustang Outrider. One of the really cool things about this project is that when it's complete, CDOT has committed to running hourly or half-hourly service to the city. This will mean that residents of the city that commute to Denver can easily commute to Denver by bus, which will take vehicles off the road, and visitors to the city can do the same. So they'll be able to come on the bus. The Clear Creek Greenway, which is part of that Peaks to Plains Trail that Rachel talked about, is completed throughout the city. There's 3.2 miles here, and that's connected to the new trail project as well that I was just discussing, as well as it will be accessible to some of the other trails that are available in Clear Creek County. So it'll be possible to take mass transit and get a bike here or to bring your own bike and access those trails and experience that, that Greenway Peaks to Plains Trail and all the other different kinds of recreational amenities that we have here in Idaho Springs. One thing I'm most excited about about this project is with that Greenway connection to those mountain bike trails we're developing, those downhill mountain biking trails, it'll be the only mass transit serves mountain bike trail system like that in the state, which I think will definitely reduce some of the congestion that you see at like Apex or those trails that are right on the western edge of the Metro Denver region and hopefully bring more people to, to our community in a sustainable way. Next slide. That's all I've got for my presentation, but happy to take questions. So uh, for any questions related to either Jonathan or Rachel's presentation, please submit them in the Q&A feature in Zoom. Uh, screenshot here kind of directing you where to go. Uh, and then we'll, we'll answer them, we'll pose them live to the panelists. Take them from there. So and then one question is, what are the plans to encourage people to try these alternative ways to access Idaho Springs? That's going to be a big project for us. We, our residents, you know, our residents are very excited about this. And I think most of them are familiar with what's, what's happening with Bustang and Project Pegasus and Outrider. And I think in our region, that's something that's also been developed pretty strongly. We have a very strong intra-county transit service. And we work extensively with Gilpin County and Jefferson County as well to make sure there's access to important community resources in each place. For Denver users, we have marketing budget that's set aside in that enterprise fund I was talking about from parking revenue for marketing. And I think one of the things that we're focusing on is making mass transit opportunities um, both accessible and reliable and attractive. Um, recently, there was the free transit opportunities, the month long of free transit that we had throughout the state. And I think we have a budget to maybe provide some of those same services to Idaho Springs and just on that, that transit line to Vail once it's all completed. And that's going to be, I think that's going to be the next part of this process because we know that if we're going to have mass transit work on Interstate 70 and we're going to reduce the vehicle miles traveled on Interstate 70, we're going to have to make sure that it, it fits into people's lives. One other really important aspect of this is we have a housing crisis here in Clear Creek County that's fairly significant. And I know that's not different than anywhere else in Colorado, but one of the challenges for us is with our service economy, with what is typically the salaries associated with those jobs, it's very difficult to live anywhere close to the city within an hour. This transit service is going to dramatically increase our ability to get employees as well as places like Loveland Ski Area and Echo Mountain to get employees in our, in our rafting companies. And I think that that's going to be one of the first areas where this mass transit really comes into play is just helping people get here to their jobs. Another question for Rachel. So what other types of amenities or infrastructure are needed in order to um, entice people to use the trails to access trailheads? Well, I think that we will have to do a little bit more marketing as well, just um like Jonathan alluded to with the mass transit. Um, we also have um, just completed a process where we're looking at access management to all our trailheads. And uh, that, that plan is fresh, so we haven't implemented it yet, but it provides a guide for us to use in a toolbox to look at our trailheads and understand um, what 
options there are for reducing the congestion. Um, so we're looking at things like shuttles, um, discounts for ride share programs, uh, paid parking, reservation systems, all of that, all of the stuff that you're seeing happen in a lot of the other agencies, land management agencies around the uh, front range and around the country, we're considering those as well. Um, but it's a new process, so we don't have any answers just yet for what else uh, might be coming up down the road. Great, thank you. Well, if any other questions come up in the meantime, we do have a second Q&A period down the road. So in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and transition to our next speaker. So our next speaker is Alex Hyde-Wright, who's the Principal Transportation Planner with Boulder County. Alex? Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Dylan. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So I'm going to be presenting an overview of the recreation shuttles that are currently in operation in Boulder County. I can go to the next slide. So this is a map that shows the four uh, transit services that are specific to recreation that are operating in Boulder County, uh, starting in the southwest corner of the county, the Hesse shuttle. Uh, Boulder County launched this service back in 2012. Uh, so this is our 11th year of service. And then in 2017, the city of Boulder launched the Park to Park shuttle to Chautauqua. My colleague, Danny O'Connor is gonna present on that service next. And then in 2020, Boulder County launched the Eldo shuttle service. And then in 2021, uh, CDOT brought back uh, bus tank service uh, between Denver, Boulder, Lyons, and Estes Park, and on into Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, so today I'm gonna to present on the HESI and Eldo shuttle systems. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we operate a shuttle at HESI and then also a traffic checkpoint that I'll talk a little bit more in a minute. Uh, next slide. Uh, so what's the appeal of the HESI area? So up at HESI on 4th of July, we have snow-capped peaks, we have lakes, we have waterfalls. If that is your thing, uh, that is one of the biggest draws to our HESI and 4th of July area. Next slide. Uh, so for a quick overview of the lay of the land, uh, in the center of the map here is the town of Menderland. Uh, down and to the right is the city of Boulder. Uh, there is an RTD bus route that links Boulder and Nederland. That's the regional route NB. And then our HESI shuttle operates between Nederland and the HESI trailhead, as denoted by the green line. Um, and then another four miles up the road, we have the 4th of July trailhead. You can see the various parking quantities that we have at the different trailheads here. Um, our primary operations are based out of the Netherland High School, which is just outside of the town of Netherland, where between the high school lots and the on-street parking, we have approximately 240 spaces uh, for shuttle parking. And that's also where we set up our traffic checkpoint. Uh, next slide. So this is just a quick shot of our HESI shuttle at the HESI shuttle turnaround. Uh, so this is the trailhead where folks can embark on the shuttle. Uh, the road heading uphill to the right is the access point for the 4th of July trailhead. Next slide. So for HESI shuttle at a glance, our shuttle season, we run from Memorial Day weekend through mid-October. So we've got about five more weeks left. Uh, in 2022, we're operating Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. Uh, we go from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Saturday and 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Fridays, Sundays, and holidays. Uh, shuttles depart every 15 minutes and we take uh, 14 seated passengers on each vehicle. Next slide. All right, so our costs, um, the cost uh, for the riders is free, uh, so we don't charge a fare for this service. On Fridays, it takes two vehicles to operate the route, Saturdays, four vehicles, and then three vehicles on Sundays and holidays. Uh, we're operating approximately 2,100 service hours in 2022, and then our operating costs for the season are about 250,000 for the shuttle service and 330,000 total for the program. Uh, that difference is the parking lot lease, uh, portable toilet rental, signage, and a couple other miscellaneous items. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is a quick overview of our ridership. Um, so you can see for the first five or six years or so of shuttle service, uh, we're growing uh, rather steadily, uh, but slowly. And then in 2017, our usage just really started to take off and that trend only accelerated uh, during the last couple of years of the pandemic. Um, so in 2020, we operated a pretty abbreviated season starting I think about six weeks late. 
Uh, we didn't operate during lockdown uh, in May or June. And then we also severely restricted capacity on our shuttles. Uh, so that 2020 ridership was a bit artificially depressed by our capacity restrictions. And then you can see when we lifted those restrictions in 2021, our ridership really shot up. And then 2022 data is through Labor Day weekend and we have another six, five or six weeks of service. Uh, so we're on pace uh, to break all of our records again this year. So on the left, you can see annual boardings going up. And then on the right, you can see uh, daily boardings also going up. And then in 2021, we also started operating the shuttle on Fridays. Uh, and then in 2021, uh, we had a 64% 64, 64 transit mode share to the HESI trailhead on weekends. Um, and we'll probably be on pace for a similar number in 2022 as soon as we uh, tabulate that at the end of the season. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is a shot of the Netherlands High School. This is actually from July 2020. So when we had the capacity restrictions, uh, this is the line of folks waiting to get on. Um, back in summer of 2020, we had lines of an hour and a half uh, for folks waiting to get on the shuttle uh, to head up to the trailhead. Uh, next slide. All right, so then a couple of productivity metrics for the HESI shuttle. Um, so if anybody is familiar with how RTD evaluates the performance of their routes, they typically look at two metrics, um, subsidy per boarding and boardings per hour. And for both of those metrics, our weekend service is on par with the performance of RTD's urban, local, and suburban local routes. Um, so you can see our subsidy per boarding has been creeping down over the last few years, and then our shuttle boardings uh, per hour have been uh, trending up over the last several years. Um, Go ahead on the next slide. And then this is a shot of our overflow parking at the high school. So if you squint in the distance of the road, that's our high school uh, lot, which is the base of our shuttle operations for most of the season. And then once the parking in those lots fills up, uh, we park an additional 100 to 120 cars on the county road. Uh, next slide. Uh, then we operate a traffic checkpoint in front of the high school. So we have 133 total parking spaces behind this checkpoint at our two trailheads. And when that parking fills up, uh, we block the road and direct everybody uh, to the shuttle parking in the high school. Um, and on Saturdays this summer, we turned around an average of 400 cars at the checkpoint. Uh, so that's 400, uh, 400 car trips uh, that were avoided that would have completely congested our road. Uh, past the checkpoint as it uh, narrows to a, a one and a half lane dirt road at times. Um, next slide. Um, so when we don't operate that traffic checkpoint Monday through Thursday, this is often what happens to our access road to the trailhead. Uh, we have dozens of illegally parked cars. Um, it's kind of an enforcement headache. And then the road becomes a barely passable one lane road, which is not really workable for two way traffic. Uh, next slide. Uh, we have been conducting a rider survey every summer for the past few years. So we're actually up to over 300 responses now. Um, the vast majority of folks are going to Lost Lake uh, with the shortest hike to a lake from the Hesse Trailhead. 29% um, of our respondents are hearing about the shuttle from All Trails Hiking Project. Only 6% of our riders are hearing about the service through government website. The riders are overall having a very good experience. And about a fifth of them are bringing a dog. And then the top request that we get from our riders is that they want more of everything. They want us to start the shuttle earlier, run the shuttle later, add service to 4th of July trailhead, run more days of the week, add more parking options, and add more toilet paper in the toilets. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a shot of the Denver dog meetup uh, getting off of one of our shuttles, uh, contributing to our relatively high dog ridership mode share. Uh, next slide. And future plans and possibilities for HESI, uh, we will be likely implementing a timed entry parking permit system for trailhead parking next year. Um, eventually, we'd like to expand shuttle service to seven days a week, uh, which is a frequent request from our riders. Um, and we continually look at evaluate, uh, expanding shuttle service up to the 4th of July trailhead, which accesses another network of US Forest Service trails, uh, which is another frequent request from our riders. Uh, next slide. All right, so for a quick overview of the Eldo shuttle and then the state parks reservation system. Next slide. Uh, so what's the appeal? Um, Eldo, El Dorado Canyon State Park is a world-class rock climbing destination. Uh, in addition, the city of Boulder Open Space Mountain Parks has trail system 
kind of on the front door of Eldo out on the plains in front of the mountains. Um, next slide. All right, so for a route map of the Eldo shuttle, at the top of the map is the city of Boulder. We have one branch that starts at the University of Colorado and runs down Broadway in 93 with several stops along the way. We have another branch coming in from Superior, the US 36 and the Caslin Park and Ride on the right side of the map. Uh, those meet at the uh, Marshall Trailhead at Colorado 93 and 170. And then the Superior Branch continues west, stopping at Dowdy Draw Trailhead, uh, which also provides access to the South Mesa Trailhead, uh, all of which are City of Boulder open space trails, and then the shuttle heads west into El Dorado Canyon State Park. Next slide. Uh, for the Eldo Shuttle, uh, we operate Memorial Day weekend through Labor Day weekend. So this past weekend was actually our last weekend for Eldo Shuttle service. Uh, we operate Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays from 8 to 7. Shuttles depart every 20 minutes and carry 14 to 22 passengers per vehicle. Next slide. Uh, this is a shot of the Eldo shuttle leaving the Dowdy Draw Trailhead on its way to El Dorado Canyon State Park. Uh, next slide. Uh, Eldo shuttle costs. So the again, this shuttle is free to ride, um, but if you are riding into El Dorado Canyon State Park, you have to purchase a state parks pass uh, or have an annual pass. Uh, we have four vehicles operating on the Superior Branch and two on the Boulder Branch at about 1,800 service hours in 2022 and an annual costs of 125,000 uh, for this summer. Next slide. Uh, so CPW, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, launched a timed entry reservation system for El Dorado Canyon State Park this summer. Uh, that system was announced in May. Reservations went on sale July 13th and reservations we're starting to be required uh, beginning on July 23rd, uh, and that goes until September 15th. Uh, so reservations are sold in two-hour entry windows if you want to drive your car into the state park. Reservations are not required if you're riding the shuttle, um, and then the reservation system will be required weekends uh, next summer from May through September. Uh, next slide. Right, so this is a snapshot of what our ridership looks like throughout the season. Um, as you can see, we typically finish strong with the Labor Day weekend. Uh, and in 2022, you can see we had a slight bump in ridership uh, on the shuttle once reservations uh, for vehicle access to the park began. Um, and then in 2021, we had about a 3% transit mode share uh, to El Dorado Canyon State Park uh, through the shuttle. Uh, next slide. Uh, so a couple uh, graphs of boardings uh, data. Um, the we're growing slowly from 2021 to 2022. Uh, annual boardings and daily boardings up a little bit. Uh, ridership is still quite a bit lower uh, than HESI, which has been in operation for 11 years now compared to all those three years. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then we'll also look at where folks are on the shuttle. So the vast majority of our ridership comes from the El Dorado gas station market um, out at 93, State Highway 93, State Highway 170. And then most folks are getting off and on in the state park at the visitor center stop. Next slide. Uh, so Eldo shuttle productivity. Um, again, this is roughly in the ballpark of where RTD's flex ride services are operating in terms of both subsidy per boarding and boardings per hour. Um, we've been essentially flat with our productivity metrics uh, for the first three years of service uh, with Eldo. Um, next slide. Then a shot of the Eldo shuttle in front of the uh, Eldorado Canyon State Park Visitor Center. Next slide. And then we also do a rider survey um, for the Eldo shuttle. Uh, so about 85% of respondents drove to their shuttle stop, uh, which is actually a bit lower than HESI. HESI, it's more like 95 to 98% drive to the shuttle. Uh, so we have a bit more folks accessing Eldo via walking, biking, or transit. Um, again, rated highly by our riders and then suggested improvements, including include improving our signage and information and then adding service on Fridays. Um, next slide. And then unlike HESI, which has no wheelchair accessible trails, there are uh, wheelchair accessible trails uh, served by the Eldo shuttle. Uh, so this is a couple shots from our uh, planning back in 2019, uh, confirming the wheelchair accessibility of shuttle stops that we were considering. And next slide. And that is my presentation. So I believe I'm turning it over to Danny O'Connor now. 
Thank you, Alex. Danny, we'll let you take it over. Yeah, so good morning. Um, thank you. Just appreciate um, this discussion and really the opportunity to um, add on, you know, it is related to uh, City of Boulder's uh, park to park shuttle, which is part of our Chautauqua access management plan. Um, I'm Danny O'Connor. I'm the transit program manager for the city of Boulder. Um, so kind of in, in my purview, I, I uh, manage all sorts of um, different uh, transit programs. It's everything from our local transit uh, service in Boulder, the hop route, um, as well as uh, park to park shuttle, which um, operates to and from uh, Chautauqua Park. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so just some context on Chautauqua. Uh, it's a very um, famous um, and large tourist draw in Boulder. It's a national landmark. Um, it was purchased um, through city bonds in 1898, uh, consists of 80 acres. This is on the um, kind of in the southwest section of the city. Um, if you're familiar with the, with uh, Boulder, it's it's along baseline around 9th Street. Um, so baseline is that's west of uh, Broadway, southwest of CU. Um, really, the site has about 80 acres that are within um, city city open space, and, and on an annual basis has um, over a, a million annual visitors. Um, there's all sorts of amenities there. There's everything from the auditorium, which, uh, you know, hosts summer concerts and events, uh, the dining hall, lodging, has a park. And then um, there's 40 miles of trails that are within and that kind of connect in and through um, the Chautauqua Park. So we can go to the next slide, please. Um, and really kind of, um, you know, as, as Alex presented in his, um, in his discussion, um, the Chautauqua um, Park, we've really looked at a shuttle as kind of building off of uh, the success and program uh, requirements of uh, the HESI shuttle that, that Alex um, demonstrated in, in Boulder County. Um, in 20, um, really in, in 2015, we began at the city some um, concerted efforts to develop a Chautauqua access management plan, which we call CAMP. Um, and really this was designed um, to minimize the vehicular impacts that were occurring uh, with how popular um, Chautauqua is as, as far as a draw. Uh, the site has limited parking. There's 58 spaces. Um, really contained within Chautauqua for, for parking. Um, the, the park is surrounded by or, or bordered by lots of neighborhoods. And resultingly, there was, you know, before the, the plan, quite a bit of residential spillover as far as on-street traffic. And then just really as part of our, you know, our core values, um, you know, this is such a great asset to not only the city, but, you know, the region, the state, um, anything that we could do to really um, minimize uh, the impacts to these great natural and cultural resources we have here uh, at Chautauqua. So the camp plan, um, as we call it, um, has four components to it. It's the park to park shuttle. It's really some strategy around uh, free and paid parking. We have a TNC uh, Lyft Uber option that we, we have employed. And then a lot of uh, concerted promotion um, with, with partners at the Convention and Visitors Bureau to um, really kind of um, help promote not only the park, but uh, alternative ways to get to and from it. Um, so with that, really, the, this whole camp program began as a pilot project in 2017. Um, it had really great success in 17 and has been extended um, for another five years as, a, as an extended pilot, 2018 through 2022. Um, this is really codified as a City of Boulder ordinance as far as how this um, pilot program has been uh, put together, funded, and extended. Um, so we're wrapping up kind of kind of the end of the pilot uh, this year and looking for, um, you know, continuation to the future. You can go to the next slide, please. 
Um, just to kind of give you a context specific to the shuttle, um, you know, similar to what Boulder County uh, demonstrates that, you know, we, we run the shuttle um, on week weekends and major holidays from Memorial Day to Labor Day. That's really kind of the, the high peak demand that uh, we see there with the summer months. Um, it runs 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. every 15 minutes, um, you know, and without a fare. Um, like uh, Boulder County, this the service is competitively contracted uh, via mobility services in Boulder is, is our um, current operator of um, the Park to Park shuttle and, you know, provides a service with um, um, vehicles that seat between 14 and 22 have accessible, um, accessible options for, for riders. And as you can imagine, you know, um, you know, we, we see we see all sorts uh, as far as demand on on the shuttles from um, from dogs to climbing gear to uh, bikes on the front. Um, you know, we, we do everything we can to um, basically make that trek to and from uh, Chautauqua easy and, and accommodating of, of what people are bringing in need. Um, the route is designed, um, and you can see the route map to the right, but it's designed around um, kind of a, a, an alignment that circulates through downtown Boulder. It hits uh, five different parking garages in Boulder, um, including um, one that's adjacent to RTD's downtown Boulder station. So we have uh, really good access to and from uh, the, the different transit routes, as well as uh, parking, parking, parking garages in, in downtown. Um, we have, it also connects at the CU Regent lot, which is shared with um, Boulder County's El Dorado uh, shuttle. And then uh, we have one more um, park and ride that's along baseline at 20th at New Vista High School, which is, um, you know, a, a BVSD property. Uh, next slide, please. I think just as, as context, um, you know, this program has has been very, very successful, especially the shuttle ridership. Um, you know, some the latest uh, 2022 numbers as, as we've come to the end of the season, we've averaged 275 average daily riders, um, uh, over 9,300 total riders for the summer. Um, and program to date, we've seen over 90,000 riders. Um, you know, the chart to the right really shows how uh, ridership has um, fluctuated. Um, we've had some, some very strong numbers that have been over 800, um, over 600 per day, kind of in leading up until the COVID impact. Um, and you, you really see that we're now, you know, still building up ridership after um, kind of the, the impacts of COVID in 2020. Um, and somewhat in 2021, uh, 275 average daily riders. Though I mean that's a that's a metric that we're wanting to hit. Um, really, that represents approximately 10 percent of those going to and from Chautauqua on the weekends and on major holidays during the summer are are going by transit, which um, you know is a, is is a great modal share for uh, what we're trying to do here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you know, as mentioned, uh, the camp program really has uh, is multifaceted. So we've talked a little bit about the shuttle, but it's uh, paired with, um, you know, some strategic parking strategies that we really work towards um, to uh, complement the shuttle and to really kind of balance the transportation uh, demand and needs. So we have um, dynamic message boards that our um, public works team puts up um at us 36 and along baseline really to direct uh traffic um coming in and out of boulder via 36 um to our different parking lots that we have um specific for um park to park shuttle and then you know as mentioned earlier when we were looking at the route alignment there's uh, five garages that um the shuttle goes by and has stops at in downtown Boulder. On the weekends, uh, we at, at the city waive the, the parking fees for those uh, 
for those garages. Um, so those are typically paid parking uh, during the weekdays. On the weekends, they're free. Uh, so that really coincides that it, it provides, you know, 2,100 plus uh, parking spaces in the downtown that are available for park and ride to get to and from um, to and from the park to park Chautauqua shuttle. We also, um, as mentioned, have a, an annual agreement with CU where we uh, basically rent their CU Regent lot. Uh, this provides another 150 spaces. And then uh, the city also contracts with BVSD, the school district here, to secure the new Vista um, surface parking lot, which has 70 spaces. So as you can see, we have you know close to 2,500 um, basically parking spaces that are reserved, um, you know, reserved available for uh, park and ride activities, you know, which uh, really helps support what this route can can do and draw from. Um, and then with that, um, we also um, mechanize some various paid parking um, uh, programs to to help offset this. So Chautauqua, as mentioned earlier, its lot has 58 spaces. We have um, for the weekends during the summer, as well as these major holidays, when the shuttle's running, we turn on um, the metered parking uh, for these for these spots. And then we do the same along baseline in some um, streets immediately adjacent to Chautauqua, which is equivalent to about 50 plus or minus um, on-street spots. Uh, they all have kind of a, a, a two fifty two dollars and fifty cent hourly rate, um, and you know the the revenue from the metered parking, you know, in close proximity to Chautauqua is is help you know is is intended to help offset really some of the program costs that we see with um, with um, you know running this program every year. On the right, you know, here's a here's a picture of we have customized. Um, uh, signage all through town, basically helping to direct um, people to and from just um, park and ride options and, and where to access uh, the shuttle. If you can go to the next slide, please. You know, and I think, um, you know, as mentioned earlier, so we've talked about the shuttle, we've talked about, you know, a lot of our parking strategies that work hand in hand. Um, and a, a lot of what's been a very successful um, component of of this program is you know our partnership with visit boulder or the convention and visitors bureau of uh, of boulder they're tied in with the boulder chamber um, they do just such a great job um, tracking and promoting um, just you know all things in boulder from a visitor standpoint but uh, chautauqua and the park to park shuttle are are you know key messages that they help uh, get the word out um and and help use as kind of a draw for not only how to best enjoy um accessing chautauqua but um how how to how to how to really make the most of the visitor experience in boulder between the shuttle and um everything else that kind of goes in hand in hand with a, a day at chautauqua that might have some some time and visitor experience in downtown boulder um, they have a group of ambassadors, which are great, um, that um, when we have the shuttle running, they're basically at these major stops in downtown at CU Regent Lot, at the New Vista Lot, and at Chautauqua, uh, where they're helping guide people um, um, and orient them to, to the shuttle, um, you know, helping them become familiar with here's a shuttle, here's how to access it, here's the schedule. And then they also serve as, as guides, kind of explaining, you know, just what Chautauqua is, um, some of the history with it, uh, just different opportunities for them to enjoy with that. So they do quite a bit of promoting uh, everything from print and social media, um, kind of in town, and, uh, you know, have a dedicated website to uh, the shuttle and, and all that we're doing here. Um, I've got a link here that, I mean, just shows a quick commercial that they've put together. Uh, hopefully it works. Thank you for getting it going. Um, and this is kind of some of the example of, of really some of the promotion around um, around Park to Park. Yeah, thank you.
Great, thanks. Um, and next slide. So. And I guess just as you know, kind of some some context as far as um, kind of next steps and what the annual program is. It, so as mentioned, this camp program is typically around 250,000 a year. That includes the cost for um, contracting the shuttle, uh, the rentals of both the CU and BBSD um, parking lots, um, some of the parking enforcement that the city um, employs that's extra along with those um, meter parking spots um, near, the, near Chautauqua, and then some marketing expenses. And then it's really one of these great, um, you know, kind of internal coordinations that we do at the city. It involves multiple departments, OSMP, the community vitality or transportation mobility departments, all kind of working together between transportation, parking, um, and open space. Um, we are expecting that this program will be um, renewed in 2023 and, and beyond. Uh, as mentioned, it's it's right now a city ordinance. It's um, as a pilot pro program through 2022 uh, it's very popular um and you know just looking forward to uh, you know potential next steps and and capabilities with the program uh, going into the future uh, next slide please uh with that um you know that concludes my presentation i've provided a couple links in here for additional information um, the first link is the city's dedicated page to the park to park shuttle. The second is the chambers page um, specific to uh, park to park shuttle where you saw that video and kind of more of the um, visitor information that that they've really framed up with that. It's been such a key, key and uh, critical component. And then uh, there's my contact information. So happy to talk uh, further offline with anyone who might have follow up questions. So um, Thank you so much. That concludes my presentation. So. Thank you, Danny. Um, and for anybody that has any questions for any of the panelists, please go ahead and submit them in the Q&A function. Uh, an immediate question now for, I guess, both. Alex and Danny was what were some of the like the more challenging things that you faced with implementing the shuttles uh, in any of the capacities? Was it funding? Was it partnerships? Was it um, getting them, uh, you know, the, uh, the infrastructure necessary? What, what, what was the, the bigger hurdles that you faced? Danny, do you want to go first? Sure, I can start. Um, you know, I, I guess I would say, I mean, there were two two that really come to mind. Um, there was a lot of, and, and I should say there was a lot of um, really positive momentum behind it. It wasn't a, hey, this, you know, I, I think really once the plan and is comprehensive, it was put together, start to take shape. There was a lot of uh, positive momentum to it. Um, I think a few of the challenges we've seen were, were one, you know, out of the gate, there were some capital costs that, um, you know, when I talk about here's the annual program costs that the initial investment out of the gate was, was more. Um, and that really had to go with, um, you know, basically some new parking kiosks that needed to be procured um, and installed to help with managing that on-street parking um there was a bit more spent in marketing really to give it a good push going out out, out the gate um you know I, I think you know related to the shuttle you know questions we had were were a lot did you know do we have enough um frequency and demand uh, or i'm sorry do, do we have enough service out here to, to match the demand and and that's that has worked well the 15 minute frequency is dependable it's easy um but you know, those were some of the things I think coming out of the gate, and then also um, probably, you know, selecting a vehicle that could uh, work well, um, considering that you know part of the route runs through some residential neighborhoods, um, and you know, trying to find something that was small enough, um, and you know that that didn't have, um, you know, that could make those turns and so the 14 to, to 18 22 passenger 
kind of cutaway vehicles, are, you know, are, are, are doing well as far as fitting in with some of those residential streets. Uh, we do have interest and, um, you know, I think it's a community interest as well that, you know, opportunities to uh, eventually, you know, have buses or, or shuttles that aren't, that, that run on, you know, they're electric powered would be preferable um, just for the program and, and just as they're operating through town, so. I can answer for Hesse and Eldo. Um, I think one of our, probably the biggest challenge at Hesse over the past four or five years or so has just been the rapid increase in demand. Uh, we kind of use the squeeze the balloon analogy for how we handle parking. Um, and have tried various strategies for managing all of the parking at the trailheads and associated with the shuttle over the past several years. Um, as I mentioned, we're probably going to be implementing a parking reservation system for the parking at the trailheads next summer. Um, right now, we, I would say, we, we struggle to, uh, to get much of our shuttle ridership to take the RTD bus up from Boulder. So the vast majority, probably at least 95% of our HESI shuttle riders are driving up to Nederland. Um, and so we've been successful at reducing uh, traffic west of the high school to the trailheads and shifting the, uh, a large share of those rider, of those users to the shuttle. Uh, but in terms of the, the larger piece of their trip from Boulder to Nederland, uh, the vast majority of that is still occurring in private vehicles. So that's probably our largest ongoing challenge. Um, and then at Eldo, um, I would say not necessarily a, a, a challenge per se, but just a reality is that we have a lot of different agencies involved. So the county is the shuttle operator. We're serving some city of Boulder trailheads and then the route terminates uh, in the state park and the state park is um, managing the, uh, the the timed entry parking reservation system. And so I think what that system has really shown over the last couple of years is that uh, you can't just run the shuttle service in isolation. You also have to manage the parking. And so for the first two summers, we had a traffic checkpoint um, on the state highway leading into the state park uh, to turn cars around after the parking in the park was full. Um, and now there's the, the parking reservation system. So it's really just highlighted the, the importance of tackling parking at the same time as providing a shuttle alternative. Thank you both. Thank you both. Thank you both. Thank you both. Sorry about that. Sorry. So, uh, so another question to, to both of you are, are there any vehicle traffic count analyses uh, to understand the role uh, of these services in reducing trips? So I assume that's talking about vehicular traffic. Um, we can start with Danny again, and then Alex, if you have a, a, an answer to that as well, then we'll, we'll transition to you. Yeah, you know, those are those are metrics that, um, you know, we do intend to, to probably dive deeper in and come up with as part of the ending of the of the pilot with it, you know, we do track the ridership. Um, what it what does this equate to as far as uh, decreased and SOV trips is, you know, something that, you know, we're, we're interested in calculating and being able to measure that out. So we've uh, so when we originally implemented the shuttle back in 2012, we did that in conjunction with reducing some of the trailhead parking capacity on street, uh, which was really preventing our shuttle from being able to operate uh, due to the road being too narrow. Um, so that the shuttle was um, was implemented at the same time as we reduced some parking capacity at the trailhead. Um, and with the traffic checkpoint that we've been implementing at HESI, we've been very successful in limiting uh, the vehicle trips uh, leaving the high school, uh, heading to the trailheads to just trips that have a parking space where, that can accommodate them. Um, so we, as of right now, we basically allow the parking at both of the trailheads west of the high school in Netherland to fill up. And then after that, um, no cars are let past uh, until um, there's a parking space available uh, for them. Uh, so that's been pretty successful. Um, as I said before, we haven't been as successful in uh, converting trips between Boulder and Netherlands to the RTD service uh, to access the shuttle. Um, down at Eldo, 
Um, I don't have uh, vehicle entry data from this summer yet for the state park, but I know that's one of the metrics that they're gonna be tracking uh, for the, the pilot reservation system to see what impact that's having on vehicle counts coming into the park each weekend day. So a question to all of the panelists is for any local government that may wanna embark on any of the programs that you have you've started whether that's uh, increasing their trails to trailheads or looking at parking management strategies or looking at multimodal arrival to whether that's uh, recreation uh, outdoor recreation or uh, cultural recreation resources in their communities what would be the first thing that you would recommend for them to get started on or what would be the first thing that they need to think about so we'll start with Rachel, not to put you too much on the spot, and then go with Jonathan, Danny, and then Alex. I would say the first thing is to consider all the partners that would be involved in making something like um, any of these programs successful. Um, as I pointed out, there are lots of partners in Jeffco that were involved in the trails plan and continue to be involved. And it sounds like the other folks also have multi-agency partnerships. So kind of figuring out who those people are, who the players are, and then um, really thinking about what the issues are and how each player um, can address issues within their realm would be my starting point. I think I would say it's really important to have a community plan and to think about what you're trying to accomplish, especially for a municipality. Works a little bit different for a county, I know, but what we try to do is establish what our goals are related to managing tourism and just take asset of or stock of our assets and think about ways that we can <clears throat> promote those goals using the assets that we have. A lot of times we talk about taking contextually sensitive approaches to these problems because they change very dramatically, like within a quarter mile about where a trailhead can be or where Clear Creek runs, or for instance, on the Peaks of Plain Trail, there's there's portions that may need tunnels. And that's expensive, but it may provide those connection options that are really needed for the community to have multimodal transit in that area. So that's what I'd say is just center the work in what the goals and outcomes you're expecting to see are. <clears throat> yeah, I, I would echo what's been said. I think those are really good points. Um, I. I would, I mean, I, I guess one piece of advice is I, I would, you know, think of it as a um, comprehensive program and package that it's, um, it's not just running a shuttle or, um, you know, that there's multiple facets that have to be kind of programmed and, and worked in together. So, um, you know, it's, it's the shuttle, it's ensuring that you know, in our case, it's we have the shuttle, we have bike bike lanes, we have uh, a pedestrian network, we have all the multimodal um, options to and from, um, and then you know finding a way to get it um, uh, branded and and messaged, and then to you know balance it and tie it in with whatever parking um, parking availability you have. And you know the availability you have uh, capacity plus you know kind of the control over how to, how to best leverage that to to make the program a success. And I guess one more thing, I and I think the other way to you know I mean from the branding and the messaging is you know I mean we've really seen it as a. Um, um, you know, it hits various city priorities and values, but it has a, and it, it does have a, you know, a, a specific economic driver uh, component to it, just with all the tours, tourism that comes in um, and, you know, having a program that's, that's kind of well-designed and, and, you know, comprehensive really can take advantage of, um, of the, the tour, tourist volume to your, to the community. Um, and then you know ensuring that that um that experience is 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 good for the visitors so that they repeat and and others come too so 
I don't think I have too much to add. Jonathan stole most of what I was going to say about figuring out what your goals are in terms of, you know, if you're considering a shuttle system, are you trying to provide non-vehicular access as an option? Is your goal to reduce the number of car trips? Is your goal to reduce the amount of parking and really tailoring your strategies towards what your goals are? And then I think another sobering lesson for us has been how um, how folks hear about our shuttle programs is not through our websites and communications. They're hearing about them through apps and other third-party sources that we don't control. Uh, and so being creative in your marketing and messaging to get information to your customers. Great. Well, thanks everybody um, and to all of our panelists for speaking on your projects today. Not seeing any other open questions, so I'll go ahead and wrap up here and say that uh, on this last slide, you can see my contact information. If you have any additional questions or anything that you want to reach back out to, you're welcome to reach back out to myself or my colleague Emily, and we're happy to to connect you in the right place. And uh, this presentation has been recorded, so it will be uploaded to drpog.org. You can find it. The easiest way to find it is on our uh, events page and then on the calendar. If you click on this uh, calendar link for the Metro, Metro Vision Idea Exchange, uh, you should be able to find the recording there. Uh, you'll also be able to find the slides, um, which may have some of the, the contact information that our panelists have shared. If you have any direct questions that you want to reach back out to them on. Um, Thank you for your time and thank you to our panelists. Um, without any further ado, we'll go ahead and wrap up the idea exchange and, and thank you all. <laughs>